Good day everybody, uh, welcome to the channel. Today we're going to be making a small departure from the typical fare of electronics reverse engineering into the more military side of technology and specifically the sinking of the Slava class Moskva cruiser on the 13th of April 2022, about 100 kilometers due south of Odessa. So uh, late in the evening, around 8 o'clock uh, Kiev time, uh, 13th of April, uh, there was reporting coming from an advisor of uh, President Zelensky and uh, defense officials from Odessa that the uh, Moskva-class cruiser that had been loitering uh, off the coast had been hit by two uh, Neptune anti-ship missiles and has either been destroyed or already sunk. And of course, uh, this type of information coming from Ukraine, even though generally credible uh, in the last while, always requires a healthy dose of skepticism and some real tangible evidence to back up uh, such claims. Premier Kisov's calling again and he's hopping mad. And uh, curiously enough, some hours later at uh, two in the morning Moscow time, now already on the 14th of April, there was a report uh, by RIA Novosti, the Russian press service, that yes, indeed, the Moskva had been uh, hit by some missiles, that it was on fire and being evacuated. So uh, at the time uh, in the Black Sea, uh, weather was... Uh, dusk, seven degrees, about uh, meter high seas, and a southeasterly 14 knot wind. So uh, not great conditions, not terrible either. He's going down, sir. Put a shot across his bow. Come right, 180. So, of course, a strike like this onto uh, a warship that size is going to uh, wreck quite some havoc, and it all really comes down to the damage control of the crew if uh, the ship is going to be salvageable or not. So, looking at the Moskva itself, how did they know to target it? What was the ship capable of? So, generally, uh, just by sort of OSINT, uh, open source intelligence, we had a fairly good idea of where the Moskva was sitting around at. It uh, was part of the Snake Island uh, attack group, and after that uh, incident, it was uh, hanging around the waters just off the horizon south of Odessa, uh, giving uh, air cover to the other ships that were mostly firing uh, caliber type uh, cruise missiles against ground targets in Ukraine. So the information we were able to gather uh, by either satellite intelligence, both uh, synthetic aperture radar, SAR, and uh, optical imagery, uh, the ships and the groups operating in the Black Sea were fairly well identifiable, and even their movements could be uh, tracked roughly. So with observations from Sevastopol, the uh, main naval port in Crimea, uh, we were able to get an image of Moskva's movements that it had uh, sailed towards uh, Sevastopol around the 4th of April. Uh, on the 6th, it uh, had already reached Sevastopol for the usual resupply. And then after a couple of days, it uh, sailed back out towards the area of operation south of Odessa. And this was a cycle that uh, repeated itself uh, multiple times over the past month of this war. And uh, the position on the 13th, just south of Odessa, makes perfect sense. Now, these are just... Uh, you know, information that uh, you or I could gather uh, through open source uh, uh, information. But the more detailed uh, position reports, of course, come from military satellites, either optical or, again, radar, that are able to detect these ships, locate them. And on top of that, uh, there have been recent flights of the, the uh, RQ-4B Global Hawk drones, also equipped with uh, synthetic aperture radar, and uh, with the combination of the uh, RC-135 rivet joint intelligence aircraft and uh, all the other uh, intelligence assets operating every day over uh, Romania, Poland, and uh, the Black Sea. 
certainly the military side of things has a very good and detailed picture of where these ships are located and uh, this information is being uh, fused and uh, transferred over to the Ukrainians, not as uh, raw intelligence, but certainly as uh, summarized reporting uh, to give them positions of these ships that uh, they could use for their uh, own operations. So the Moscow itself, as I said, is a Slava-class cruiser laid down in 1976. Uh, it has a length of 186 meters and a displacement of 12,500 tons. It was actually uh, built in Ukraine. Uh, its uh, main armament uh, consists of uh, a double uh, 130 millimeter cannon, uh, some P-1000 uh, Vulcan uh, anti-ship missiles. These were previously uh, P-500 uh, type missiles. Uh, furthermore, its main uh, uh, use in the Black Sea operations was as an air defense platform. So it's uh, armed with the S-300F uh, navalized air defense system called FORT. Uh, this is the SAN-6 system, 64 missiles in an 8x8 VLS. Also, it comes with a shorter range air defense system, the OSA-M, the SAN-4, and on top of that, it is armed with uh, six AK-630 uh, close-in Gatling gun-type weapon systems. So all in all, it is fairly well matched to uh, provide air defense uh, for its uh, ship groups operating in the Black Sea. Crewed by uh, 500 sailors, uh, it was the sort of flagship of the uh, Black Sea operations fleet for the uh, anti-Ukrainian operations. So if we take a sort of more detailed look at the diagram I have here, you can see that it is equipped with a bunch of sensors and antennas. So uh, above the bridge on the forward mast, we have the uh, MR710 Fregat uh, top steer or top plate. This is an air surveillance radar. Uh, that gives it its sort of general situation awareness. Uh, behind that, on the aft mast, we have the MR-800 Voschod uh, top pair radar system. This consists of both big net and top sail uh, antennas. This is a 3D long-range air search radar. And then heading towards the back, uh, on the stern, we have this sort of dome-shaped uh, radar system. This is the Volna or top dome. This is the fire control director for the S300F system. Uh, on top of that, uh, we have the Bass Tilt, the MR123 radar system or the fire control. This is for the close in weapon systems, the 6AK630 uh, six barrel Gatling gun turrets that are located uh, to port and starboard and a further two turrets. Uh, up front. Uh, as far as further radar goes, uh, there is the fire control kite screech radar for the main gun and the uh, MPZ301 pop group. This is the OSA fire control radar. And finally, there is the palm front navigation radar too. So certainly well equipped with a bunch of different uh, systems that would allow it to detect incoming missiles and uh, be aware of what's going on. Also, there is the argument or front door C uh, targeting radar. This is for guidance of the uh, P-1000 Vulcan uh, anti-ship missiles. So all in all, one would uh, think that this ship would be fairly well capable of defending itself against any kind of airborne threats. But what we saw is that it took uh, two anti-ship missiles to the port side, uh, burned and sank. So as you can see, the positioning of the anti-ship missiles in their paired uh, launchers, uh, eight on each side, uh, both with their warheads and their uh, solid propellant motors, these prove a incredible fire hazard on deck. So really any impacts uh, on that ship are going to be uh, very, very dangerous uh, damage control is going to be very difficult because just the enormous flammability uh, capacity on that ship. So initial reporting was after taking two missiles to the side, it was on fire, 
uh, some other Russian ships assisted to evacuate the crew. And uh, seeing the sea state and the time of day incoming darkness, uh, it doesn't look like much damage control was achieved. And uh, as I had predicted, uh, it was put under tow and eventually uh, broke the tow cable and sank. Uh, one wouldn't expect too much more of the Russian Navy. Of course, the uh, hard-won damage control tactics uh, by the U.S. Navy in the Pacific uh, in the Second World War were not something that the Russian Navy was able to uh, learn and uh, certainly uh, weren't very prodigious in uh, general damage control capability and efforts. So that is as far as the uh, MOSFA goes. Uh, let's have a look at the uh, missiles that struck it, the uh, Neptune uh, complex. So this is a Ukrainian-made uh, system designated R-360. Uh, it was uh, started to be developed sometime before 2015 by the Luke uh, Design Bureau. Uh, it basically uh, consists of a fairly large uh, anti-ship missile that is both inertially guided and has an active radar seeker for terminal guidance, has a range of up to 280 kilometers, uh, as you can see on these range maps, so anywhere on the Ukrainian coast covers uh, a fairly good area of the Black Sea that could certainly uh, interdict operations of any Russian navy. Uh, carries a warhead of 150 kilograms, is a sea skimming type that operates between 3 and 10 meters e above sea level, and has a speed of about 1,000 kilometers an hour, 620 miles an hour. So this uh, last bit of information, sea skimming, will be quite inf uh, important to understand how it was able to strike the Moskva. Uh, since uh, both the short and long-range air defenses, the OSA-M and the F-300F, uh, uh, are both limited in uh, engagement altitude to more than 20 meters. So this coming anti-ship missile in sea skimming, we had seas of 1 to 2 meters, so it could easily have been doing uh, 3 or 4 or 5 meters uh, above wave crests. Uh, it would not have been either detectable or engageable by the missile-borne air defense, and uh, the only remaining option would have been the uh, close-in weapon system AK-630. Uh, there would have been either two or four turrets in the field of view of the missile. Uh, again, certainly the radar that guides these uh, cannons would have been restricted due to sea clutter from waves and just the very low uh, engagement altitude or flight pro profile of the Neptune. And realistically, with a one kilometer engagement uh, distance, it would have had less than three seconds to engage destroy the Neptune. And uh, I would uh, speculate that uh, Russian crews operating these systems, sitting far away from the Ukrainian coast, uh, thinking themselves fairly safe, probably not having too much intelligence about the uh, capabilities and availability of the Neptune system, they probably would have kept their uh, sort of air defense close and weapon systems in uh, standby mode. You wouldn't want to be uh, walking down the deck and have the uh, AK-630 start firing off randomly or they're having their uh, sister ships launching uh, Calibre cruise missiles. They wouldn't want any sort of false engagement, so they would have kept the system in some kind of manual or semi-automatic mode where it wouldn't be uh, on hair trigger to engage any incoming threats because they just didn't feel threatened and I'm sure they were aware that their uh, sort of technological automation systems aren't all too reliable so you wouldn't want to have any accidents you keep the safety on. So uh, as far as again to the Neptune so it's powered by a turbojet motor it has an uh, active radar in its nose, so the flight profile and launch, you basically put in uh, target coordinates where you expect or know the ship to be, you program in a course vector uh, with its heading, you launch the missile towards that site, and uh, it continues in sea skimming mode to close to the target, engages its uh, active seeker radar, confirms and designates the target, and does its uh, terminal approach 
until impact. So the Neptune complex was uh, sort of adopted by the Ukrainian Navy, at least on paper, sometime in the summer of 2020. Uh, the next uh, sort of benchmark was initial testing, which occurred in March 2021, with the Navy receiving one launcher. Uh, there were some test launches made, as you can see, on uh, barges uh, with uh, radar reflectors and whatnot. And uh, the missile proved capable, but they were having some difficulty uh, with the active seekers. So it was uh, certainly a sort of still in development system. The uh, first division was uh, seen on parade in uh, August of 2021, uh, the Independence Day Parade in Kiev. This consisted of a command vehicle, a launcher, a mineral U radar unit, a transloader, and four transporters. So the radar that's included uh, in the system would be for initial detection and location of targets. Uh, it would not be necessary for an engagement where you have uh, target information coming off uh, different sensors or through intelligence, where you could uh, program in the expected coordinates for a rough inertial navigation approach and then do your final terminal guidance uh, through the active radar seeker. So the information we have is that the first division of uh, approximately four launchers, each armed with four tubes and four missiles, was supposed to be delivered in early uh, 2022 to the Navy, presumably in January, and that is also the time that supposedly the second division was put into production. Of course, these dates with uh, such large uh, procurement uh, contracts and programs are usually quite delayed, but uh, seeing that uh, it was launched in April successfully against a target, it's quite clear that the proficiency of the Ukrainian uh, armed services really didn't allow any slip in schedule and saw this as a very high priority program and ensured that uh, it would be completed on time without uh, any slip ups. So that is uh, all pretty much to the Neptune missile itself. Now let's look at the tactics that were used for the strike on the Moskva. So this is all uh, preliminary information. We do not have a uh, great confirmation of this, but uh, the supposed story is that a TB2 Baryakhtar was uh, launched towards the uh, strike group, including the Moskva, as a distraction. It uh, sort of flew around and captured the attention of the air defense crews, and supposedly at that time, the two Neptunes were launched. Uh, I wouldn't really know to say if uh, four missiles were launched, only two hit, or if another target was uh, targeted but maybe missed. There were initial speculation that the uh, Admiral Essen had been hit, but uh, this doesn't seem to have uh, come to fruition. Uh, certainly, if they were firing off a four-missile truck, you'd think that they might launch all, all four uh, missiles just to ensure target saturation. But as far as we know, uh, to definitely hit. So initial sort of rumor mill uh, speculation was that, yes, the Baryakhtar was used to distract the radar, and since, you know, the, the radar is pointing at the Baryakhtar, it's blind to the other side, and then the missiles were able to hit. But this, of course, makes no sense if one has a uh, minor understanding of uh, naval radar. Uh, these are rotating antennas. There's even two separate systems. Uh, they rotate at uh, more than 10 times a minute. Uh, this is not a sort of blinding distraction that's able to be done at a drone. You don't point your uh, radar uh, at a target and leave it fixed there and become blind to everything else. So theoretically, the ship uh, would have been able to uh, detect the anti-ship missiles incoming, but uh, uh, an important sort of aspect is not the radar blinding, but the uh, distraction and loss of situational awareness by the radar crews. So they have this Baryakhtar, they've uh, sort of been uh, taught by, you know, fairly realistic propaganda that uh, this is a very powerful killing machine and that they want to deal with it as soon as possible. So while they're scrambling to engage the Baryakhtar, de uh, detect it, designate it, launch against it, uh, they would have lost situational awareness for a target that they wouldn't have been expecting. They certainly didn't have 
uh, an idea that anti-ship missiles were something that the Ukrainians had in their uh, inventory and that uh, could be very dangerous to them. So uh, this could have just been a rumor if there wasn't a video that came out uh, in the past few days uh, of the Admiral Grigorovich class frigate uh, Admiral Essen uh, that is shown to be detecting a Baryakhtar, so you can see in the video here, uh, we're on the bridge, uh, the CIC radar control is calling out uh, the detection of a Baryakhtar. The captain gives the command to launch a 3S-90M type uh, anti-air missile, and we don't see the end of that instrument, presumably the Baryakhtar was not hit. So this actually uh, uh, fits quite nicely to confirm uh, a sort of test mission in the days preceding the 13th of April strike to test out the situational awareness of the surface combatants uh, south of Odessa, their reaction time, their de detection capability. And, you know, one could uh, extrapolate from this that uh, a few days prior to the fateful strike, uh, this sort of feint and testing uh, mission was flown uh, just to practice for the real thing. So, uh, as far as future effects of the loss of the Moskva, uh, it wasn't so much a threat to ground targets uh, in Ukraine. Uh, its uh, P-1000 Vulcan anti-ship missiles didn't really have a land attack capability, but it was providing the main air defense umbrella for the other uh, cruise missile carrying ships in that area. So its loss uh, has definitely wiped out uh, a, a solid air defense umbrella for those ships in the Western Black Sea. And even though in Sevastopol there is an S-400 system uh, operational, this definitely takes some pressure off of Odessa, gives the Ukrainians uh, breathing room to do uh, more air operations in the southwestern areas of Ukraine. And most importantly, perhaps, is the massive morale boost that the Ukrainians have experienced with this success and the corresponding loss of morale for uh, the Russian military. So uh, an interesting uh, confirmation of uh, this attack was that uh, on the coming morning of the 14th of April, since, of course, the ship was hit, you know, 100 kilometers south of the coast, uh, beyond visual range, so certainly no uh, pictures from uh, Ukrainians in Odessa looking through binoculars being able to see smoke and fire, um, there was a fairly curious launch of three aircraft from uh, NAS Sigonella in Sicily, uh, of a P-8 Poseidon and two RQ-4B Global Hawk drones, uh, both the typical Forte 10 or Forte 11 call sign that operate almost every day over the uh, southern Black Sea. Uh, and on top of that, a NATO uh, Global Hawk, so three aircraft leaving early in the morning on the 14th looking to do BDA bomb damage assessment uh, on this Russian cruiser. So, interesting confirmation of everything. Uh, I want to just say a couple more words on the sort of rumor mill that has followed this story. So, initial reports were that uh, there was most Morse code being uh, detected and a continuous wave of, you know, SOS and uh, emergency calls from the Moskva. Uh, these, uh, to my experience, have all been of other uh, radio calls and uh, transmissions not of this case, not that uh, the Russians do use Morse code uh, still as a communications uh, method, uh, specifically the uh, strategic bomber fleet every time they uh, take off to launch uh, air-launched uh, cruise missiles against Ukraine, you can hear them on the continuous wave uh, uh, long wave uh, radio net, so on uh, 3531 and 3596 kilohertz, uh, you can hear their coded, uh, lettered, and numbered uh, transmissions. Uh, I just wanted to dispel that. Then there was uh, some talk of either harpoons being used or harpoons being delivered from Britain. This makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, British and American harpoons have all been 
uh, uh, exclusively in naval service ship-launched missiles. Uh, they do not have a handy land-based, truck-based uh, launch system. They would not be delivering these missiles to Ukraine, where Ukraine would have to spend weeks or months reverse engineering the fire control, you know, hooking up a laptop and an Arduino and some kind of rusty launch rail off the coast of Odessa. You would not want to be messing around with uh, a system that's not combat-proven, uh, especially in such a critical strike role and uh, with the threat of uh, Russian uh, detection and counterfire. Uh, the most uh, useful thing that Ukraine could use now, since we do suspect that the uh, Neptune stockpile is very limited and that this was pretty much a one-off deal uh, hitting the Moskva, uh, they would certainly use the NSM uh, anti-ship missile from Norway built by uh, Kongsberg Defense that does have a, uh, a land launch capability. I believe it's built by Poland, some uh, big uh, tell truck that uh, is able to launch these missiles. That is definitely a system that Ukraine would need. Um, also, prior to the uh, confirmation of the sinking of the Moskva by uh, Russian news, uh, either late on the 14th or today on the 15th, I was speculating, you know, okay, if it's been fairly badly damaged, they'll try and tow it back to uh, Sevastopol. Um, there is a, a naval yard there. They do have a dry dock that would be capable of receiving the ship. But it was clear uh, from the get-go that any even medium damage to that ship would be unrecoverable for the Russians in the Black Sea, since even at the uh, shipyard in Sevastopol, they do not have the expertise, they do not have the equipment, they do not have the manpower uh, to fix this thing up and return it back to service. And uh, as we saw, they weren't even able to drag it back to port. It sunk on the way, so definitely serious damage occurred. Uh, magazines go going up, uh, the main targets there would have been the uh, P-1000 uh, missiles and uh, the uh, S-300F components that would have just blown the guts out of the ship and uh, without massive, you know, very efficient uh, counter flooding, damage control, uh, buoyancy control, uh, it would have been impossible to keep that thing afloat. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I will be making more content regarding Russian technology uh, that has been discovered during this war. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel. Uh, I hope both uh, new and old viewers will be interested in this kind of content. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye-bye.